The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Vanguard Investments Australia Limited, ABN 7207288086, AFS22-7263, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to another Ensemble podcast series. I'm Tanya Carlson, financial advisor and owner of Amplify Wealth Management. And I'll be hosting this series where we explore how Australia retires. We have some great content to unpack brought to you by Vanguard, who conducted their 2024 research on how Australia retires, which included a cross selection of working and retired Australians, as well as an in-depth discussion with a talented and experienced financial advisor who specialises in retirees. Together, we will explore the current key insights and share some ideas that the advice community can explore further. Let's get started. Vanguard partners with advisors to give you and your clients the best chance for investment success. We support advisors with differentiated thought leadership, unique practice management ideas, high quality products and deep investment expertise. Our commitment is to help you, your clients, and your practice succeed long-term, aligning our mission with yours. Learn more at vanguard.com.au forward slash advisor. Welcome to the Ensemble podcast. I am Tanya Carlson, your host for this series, and I'm a financial advisor and owner of a business called Amplify Wealth, located in the southern Sydney suburbs. Today, we are going to explore how Australia retires, brought to you by Vanguard. Uh, And in March 2024, Vanguard conducted a research report on how Australia retires, which included over 1,800 national participants. The purpose is to contribute to a shared understanding of people's experience retirement in the context of Australia's superannuation system. And we're joined today by Libby Newman, who is the Senior Investment and Research Specialist at Vanguard Australia. Welcome, Libby. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your role. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's a very long title, but mainly my, my role at Vanguard is to act as a inter- interface between our investment strategy group, which is actually 65 strong globally, and they do a lot of research around retirement, investments, a range of different things, economics, all the, all the usual stuff. Um, and so I, have, I work quite closely with the guys and girls who put this report together. Um, But my main role is to speak with advisors around the country around all of those issues. So retirement, investments, the economy, you name it, that's that's my jam. So yeah, great to be here today. Wonderful. We're going to do a deep dive into all those fun things today together. Fantastic. Excellent. So I thought we might take a deep dive into some of the key takeouts um, of the report. There's about four to five areas um, that we probably want to discuss, um, but I thought we might start with housing because I think uh, home ownership is is something that most people really value um, and certainly an important pillar of uh, retirement as it provides sort of shelter and security um, and potentially a source of equity, I guess. Um, now, your research sort of found that, uh, I guess, four out of five people are homeowners or, or, in fact, more interestingly, I thought that one out of five are renting um, in retirement. Yeah, and we found that actually owning a home outright is really a significant predictor of your retirement confidence. So that homeowners are actually two to three times more confident about their retirement than renters. And also that they're... Um, I think it was interesting just having a look at the the different demographics there that the retirees showed a really strong emotional attachment to the family home where they envisaged that they would see out the, the rest of their days relative to 
probably working age and maybe earlier in, the, in their working age who viewed it more as a potential source of funds. I thought it was interesting that not as many retirees thought that they might be using their family home for that source of funds as well. But, yeah, yeah it definitely has a big impact on confidence in retirement. Mm. Probably makes sense, doesn't it, if you think about if you own your home and you, you, you're not – you're not at risk of being uh, turfed out or, or having that cost increase without your control. Yeah. Um, yeah. That would be a concern. But I think you're right. I thought that was really interesting as well that um, I think when we think about working Australians and we're not at retirement phase or certainly what I see from an advice perspective, um, you know, you're sort of feeling like, oh, well, I can always sell the home if I, mm-hmm. if I need some money. But what we see with our retired clients is the home is their real safe haven. It's where they spend a lot of their time in, in most cases or certainly in those quieter years of retirement, um, maybe yeah. not early retirement. And so yeah. the thought of being uprooted um, just to downsize and release equity is actually overwhelming uh, for some people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So that's that. And the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting, and, and this is where the, the uh, report was so helpful, was um, those different age demographics. And that was that, um, you know, a third of men, millennials and, and 45% Gen Z um, who expect to ho- own a home in retirement are actually thinking they're still going to have a mortgage in retirement. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the other things that struck me as well. There was it's quite a significant proportion who are expecting they're going to have a mortgage um, and I think particularly for that younger demographic, whether they are be even going to be able to get on the property ladder and certainly envisaging mm-hmm. that they're going to be entering retirement with with a mortgage in tow as well. I think a lot of people were also thinking that they might be able to use, um, access some of that equity or maybe, you know, downsize potentially to, to release some of that yeah. equity and pay off their final debts. But um, yeah, there's definitely a, a growing cohort of, I guess, the – to fifty somethings who are who are going to be entering retirement with a mortgage with some sort of mortgage balance still in tow. So yeah, yeah. And I think given where property prices have gone in the last decade, that really does make sense, doesn't it? I mean, they're just um, yep. people if they've upgraded their home, have taken on a bigger level of debt, um, and possibly not or maybe not thought about how they will repay that. Maybe the downsize is, is their strategy. Um, yeah, but it's very interesting as we start getting nearer retirement that that people um, are now starting to feel that that's that's a definite problem for them on yeah. having this mortgage. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It probably leads into some of the parts that I think we really want to unpack a bit further, and that's that not a lot of uh, well, well, it was shocking to me um, how many people don't plan for retirement. Um, and don't sort of understand some of the things that we would probably consider some basics, like they're not sure how long their money will last, um, they're not sure how much they can spend. Um, mm-hmm. That's really, really, it must be quite overwhelming for people to not know how much they can spend each year. Yeah, but even just uh, some of the basics, like not understanding that there's a different tax environment for for super as well, or even if they're able to make contributions, I thought was surprising that um, one in four Australians didn't know whether they were able to even make additional contributions into their super. So yeah, I guess it's not surprising that there's you know that that um, fear of is my money going to last last the distance? That is definitely something that is that is front of mind, but. Um, Interestingly, those that had sort of gone down the track of getting some advice were a lot more comfortable comfortable in that regard. So, yeah, it was, it was yeah. interesting that people really want to have ownership of that was another thing that struck me. People want to have ownership of that decision and really ultimately want to be say yes or no to whatever plan is going forward. But it, was also, it also struck me that quite low on the list of people's concerns is actually knowing more about money and finance. So they really want to be able to empower to make those decisions, make but they don't really decisions. want to know about money and finance. So that was an interesting gap, yeah. I guess, where advisors potentially have a, a ch- an opportunity. Definitely an opportunity. And I think there's a, there's still a lot of work to be done. It really shows how complicated the system is, that people mm. um, want to have agency over that, but they're not quite sure how to go about that. Um, and there's a few things that we, we might touch on in that regard, but that that's – the other the other statistic that really sort of threw me was sixty seven percent, which is you know 
over two thirds of people or just on two thirds of people have not thought about or don't know what age they will need to financially plan for in terms of their retirement. So they're not mm. thinking about, hey, what am I going to do? One day I, I'm going to need to stop. Um, what does that look like? What do I have to have behind me to be able to stop working? This is my income source at the moment. The longer I work, the continuation of income coming in is consistent. Um, but either one day I probably won't want to work as much or, or if at all, or I may not have even the choice around whether that's something I can do if my health um, isn't allowing me to work. Mm, yeah. So I think, yeah, the statistic that almost half retired early than they thought they would suggests that people, and probably those people were less confident than those who retired when they had more some age, you know, probably had more agency about the timing of that. Um, I think mm. that speaks to the, the point that probably people, some people are having retirement thrust upon them earlier than they would like. I think the average age was around mm. 61, whereas I think realistically people were thinking maybe 65, 67. I think they're sort of adjusting up. Oh, people, last year, I think when we did this survey, people were going, I definitely want to retire earlier and I want to have more money to do that. But I think yeah. realist, when we asked them more realistically, they're going, actually, it's probably going to be it's like 65, 67. But yeah, a lot of people were thrust into that situation sooner than they might have anticipated. Yeah, and I think I, I, that's definitely a really interesting point, probably the one I, I highlighted blindly on my page. So I, I read the 23 report too, and that's exactly right. People um, have increased what they thought the ideal retirement age was um, up from, uh, I think, potentially around 61 or 62 up to sort of more like 67 this year. And that's uh, probably, and we're, we're dancing around a few different topics here, but, you know, potentially a number of reasons. Um, but, you know, this cost of living pressure, I think, is something that people are feeling. And so they're just not feeling in a strong financial position and perhaps thinking, well, I guess I'm going to be working for a few more years yet, um, which is which is something that will play into that. Um as an advisor, I've got a slightly different take on that sort of um, information about the fact that people, I think it was 50% that you said, retired earlier than they'd expected. Um, I guess from my perspective as an advisor, we're advising clients. So those clients that are coming to us are advised and we know from your um, research that um, certainly Australians who had sought financial advice were much more confident about their financial position We'll go yeah. back and talk about that a little further. But um, what what I think is interesting about the fact that some of those people or 50% of them retired earlier is possibly linked to that confidence. Um, I know with my clients, we're often talking to them about the fact that, hey, you, you've got enough to last your lifetime here. Um, yeah. what, are we, what, are, what are we doing? What are we working for? Um, now, not everybody wants to just – draw the line in the sand and, and sort of close up shop and retire the next day. But when we had events such as COVID, we saw people who were, you know, small business owners, there was such an enormous amount of pressure on them with how to maintain their business, manage their staff, try and see their family, all the things that we were affected by in that time. And for some of them, they knew that they were um, you know, had sufficient wealth to support their income and they just had enough and they said, that's it, I'm out. So I think it could be driven by confidence and the fact that mm. they know that they can afford to do so. There's definitely some evidence that suggests some people have those health events and just can't um, maintain work. Yeah. Um, but I, I definitely thought that was really fascinating that 50% retired earlier than they thought, which is a really, really, really big, a big number. Yeah. And probably leads to that point of, um, you know, 40% don't have a clear plan. So if you don't have a plan, how are you going to know that you could be retiring earlier or, or you know, whether you should or could? Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you have that positive spin on that because I think um, from an economic standpoint, we've seen a lot of economies around the world where actually people post-COVID did bring forward their retirement plans and then we had a couple of rocky years in the markets and maybe some of those people went back into the into the workforce. But, yeah, there's definitely a cohort who brought forward their retirement plans, seeing we've had some some pretty good years in the last couple of years in, in the markets as well um, and not wanting to, to, to deal with that stress. So, yeah, that's a, that was an interesting takeout. But definitely the, those who hadn't 
taken the time to sort of think about what retirement might look like. And it was not only looking at thinking about what retirement might look like in terms of how am I going to pay the bills or or keep the lights on, et cetera. It was also about thinking about what am I going to do with my time? Um, that was something that's not necessarily focused of 24 report, but they're definitely in the 23 report, like a lot of people who had had taken the time to think about, okay, what is my week going to look like when I'm not mm-hmm. sort of going to work or you know, what am I doing every day? And I know that I like my routine. And that's something that I'm going to have to grapple with yeah. when I get to that yeah. stage as well. So I think that 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 um, people who'd thought very broadly about what retirement looks like for them um, generally had a lot more comfort found that as a theme in both last year and this year. Yeah, good point. I think most advisors um, that are listening are probably asking their, quest- their their clients if they've got a retiree or a pre-retiree client base, you know, have you thought about how you're going to spend your time? I know it's a conversation we delve into a lot. Um, sometimes we buy clients books to read on on what to do, especially people who have been very career focused. Um, mm-hmm. But I think you're right, actually. It's something that um, definitely stood out in that 2023 report. I think um, I'm rattling things off the top of my head, but um, there was more people considering part-time work or other yep. other other sort of considerations with reduced work, I guess we'd call that. Mm. Yeah. Or even taking yeah. time in and out, come, dipping in and out from the workforce as well, I think. Yeah, it's, not, yeah. it's not just a linear relationship that you sort of work until this point and then that's nothing. It sort of can be. That's right can be a bit more fluid, I think, nowadays. So that's, yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's really what we, we're starting to see change, aren't we? The fact that you can dip in and out. It's, uh, you know, back in our grandparents' day, it was, I mean, no one would hire you once you were over 50. Um, yeah. Now we've got such a, a shortage of employees. I think it um, doesn't matter what your age, you're probably able to get some form of work, which opens up doors and opportunities for people as well. The other yeah. thing that, that I thought was interesting um is the fact that I think it was almost four in five or, or perhaps three in five of retired people were really concerned about outliving their savings. Yep. That's yep. a lot of people with, with a big worry there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And that's yeah. a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, how do we address longevity when we don't know how long we're going to be here for? Yeah. But yes, but we know. But I mean, you you have access to your practice in your practice, I imagine, to a lot of tools that sort of help to to provide some of that confidence that you know the, that you know this is this is the expectation that you can have going forward. And I can, once again, I think that's a a consistent theme that um, you know, in terms of delivering that confidence to to retirees, um, actually, those emotional components were something that they that they really um gained the most benefit from in terms of thinking about, you know, what their retirement might look like and, you know, making sure my money lasts as long as I do, feeling more confident about yeah. retirement preparation, knowing how much I can afford to spend. That actually ranked ahead of any investment considerations. In, in So it's interesting that those emotional factors were actually more important yeah. than any seed related to investments, I, I thought, as an investment specialist. Um, yes, that, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's it's very true. Well, you you will know as an investment specialist as well that behaviour is is one of those things that we yeah. really spend a lot of time managing, and um, I think none more so than that. That to me stands out as the top priority of most people that we see um, yeah. that really want to make sure that they can uh, have enough to provide for their retirement. In fact, we see that a lot of people are. You know, and and again, this comes down to this sort of planning side of things. Can be really too scared to spend their money. They might actually have a nice little nest egg, mm. but there's a lot of fear around any spending going on because of this longevity issue. So, even though um, you know, I'm sure most planners would use those tools, like you said, and and show people life expectancy rates, um, you know, the drawdown amount that they they may be sort of budgeting for. Um, and having a conversation about even the what ifs, you know, what if the kids needed some help or what if you wanted to do an extra trip because somebody offered you the opportunity, all of these things impact how long our money will last. But for some people, no matter how big that nest egg, there's still an enormous sense of um, uncertainty around, can I really, can I really afford to do this? Mm. And that's still prevalent in your research as well. Very much so. Yeah, I think that that most people were really just drawing down the minimum that um, you know 
they didn't want to draw any more than the, the government minimum at all, just because they were really worried about that money running out at some point. Um, mm-hmm. Or, you know, even thinking about like what the, what that might look like for the next generation. And there's definitely some interesting data in there about about um, yeah. that as well. Yeah, definitely. That was that was fascinating, and that kind of leads into a little bit of that um, great wealth transfer that we know. There's been a lot of um, talk about that in recent times and in the media, um, and you know, it made me think of a few things um, where I guess a, a third of younger generations in in your report expect to receive an inheritance. I and mean, that word "expect" is um, yeah. An interesting yep. word, isn't it? That they're, they're literally counting on something coming through, yep. um, and I wonder, you know, when you look at that and you think about the the data that showed that those younger generations are feeling like they're going to be retiring with a mortgage, whether perhaps, um, you know, this is something that is now going to become a strategy that advisors talk about for, for many years. We we would always say we can't rely on an inheritance as a strategy. We're not. That's not. That's not something we're going to factor in here when we're planning sure. for your eventual yeah. retirement. But mm. I think that with this wealth transfer, uh, we probably need to start asking some more questions around what that looks like and and whether that is something significant at least um, yeah. that that could pay out a mortgage or or help somebody um, or not. Um, it, the problem is it is an unknown. Um, those. Yeah, those retired or unknowns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might need to go into aged care or, or something else. You know, other medical um, situations that can be very expensive. Um, mm. So it it's hard to sort of feel that it should be a strategy to use. Yes, but I think it's something that people are increasingly, definitely that younger generation are increasingly relying on. Um, but then it was the attitudes to spending seemed quite different across the demographics as well. I think there was an expectation that. You know, I should be allowed to. It's my money. I've, I've worked hard for it, and I should be able to spend it and not necessarily leave it to the next generation. That seemed to have some some differences across the demographic cohorts as well. Whereas, interestingly, the younger generation perhaps a little bit more propensity to to leave um, to leave whatever they have to the next generation, <laughs> acknowledging that it maybe is as not not as much as 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 they would like. Um, it's always a challenge, isn't it? And I guess some people really want to and certainly retirees uh, I can't quite remember the the number here but I'll try and find it in your report that actually want to help their kids now you know they don't necessarily want yep. to leave it as a legacy they're feeling yep. that well yes you know I'd, I'd prefer not to spend on my lifestyle knowing that I can help out my kids now I think yep. there was there was certainly some higher higher numbers than probably expected in that regard as well yeah which is Interesting. And and again, a conversation that I think most advisors have probably tackled before, which is, you know, trying to, to make sure that people will be okay, that they've considered something long, like longevity before they, they're gifting their money to their children. Um, yeah. And especially if they're those those that are vulnerable to, you know, not feeling confident to spend. Yeah. But all of these are complex decisions. So, you know, that comes back to the, I guess, the, the value of having that advice in terms of structuring bequests and, and structuring the, the finance, yeah, structuring the whole situation for the broader benefit mm. of, of whoever might be um, hoping to benefit from that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So speaking of that, I mean, there was there was uh, 37% of advised Australians feel highly confident about their retirement compared to 24% of non-advised. Um mm. You know, forty percent, as I said previously, have have no clear plan for retirement, which which astounds me. <laughs> and yeah, how you I know, you could ever make this decision of yeah of stopping one day um, without really understanding that. And there was something else that was really interesting in the report, which was where those uh, unadvised Australians actually went for help with those decisions. I don't know yeah. if that was twenty twenty three um, as well, but. Um, a lot of them look to their partner and even shockingly social media. Yeah. Yeah. Increasingly social media and Dr. Google, I think, um, for a lot of that. Dr. Google. Dr. Google is stealing all our clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think um, it not was, necessarily. Um, online sources like Google, 42% from a partner, maybe 40 and then family and friends. Um, but yeah, certainly an increasing involvement in, in terms of online platforms and social media there. Which uh, mm. not regulated, so yeah, interesting. 
regulated. And I guess, um, you know, when we think about something as complex as retirement, making your money last, those, those top fears that retirees would have around not, not knowing if, they've, if they can spend, not knowing if their money's going to last, and yet they're, they're, they're watching TikTok or potentially asking a friend, which is interesting because a lot of the time we don't talk the real detail about our financial position to our friends and family. Mm, we might sort of exactly. give them a bit of an overview. Oh, I've got, an, uh, I've got a smallish mortgage or a largish mortgage or, you know, we're very vague. Um, mm-hmm. about our financial position, and yet we're seeking advice in one of the most important stages that we'll go through from those people. And then we're having a, we're seeing the evidence in your report of a lack of confidence yep. in our yep. scenario. Yep. So there's some real barriers to advice, isn't there? And, and one of the obvious ones, I guess, um, is, is fees, uh, the yep. fact that you know advisors – have to charge fees, um, and advice is is becoming more expensive. We've had, you know, three royal commission, twenty eight thousand advisors. Uh, I think as at today, we're under sixteen thousand mm. um, advisors in Australia, with I think more than five million people preparing to retire or, or retiring. Uh, mm. So we've got a real supply and demand issue there, as well as um, perhaps yeah. people just not knowing where to go. Do you think? Um, yeah, I, I think it, it was interesting that only 14% consulted their super fund or even a lot of people seem to think once they reach retirement, their super fund was not as relevant going forward. Like I think there is expectations yeah. on super funds to sort of provide some really smart solutions and make sure that it don't run out of money and, and deliver all of those things. But 40% of people sort of got to the end as like, oh, the superannuation fund only really plays a role until I retire and then after that they don't really play a role. So I thought that was interesting that there's you know, there's yep. there's seeking advice, but then there's also people going to what you would think be a natural maybe first port call for a lot of people, um, mm-hmm. to go to their super fund. So it was interesting that that confounded me a little bit. Yeah. It didn't connect. Yeah, it didn't really connect the dots. And I think we we all know that maybe apart from from homes, for for a lot of people their superannuation nest egg is their second second biggest asset outside of the home. Um, yeah. For some, yeah. you know, and I think changing generations, it will start to be a really considered uh, investment uh, or or piece to their retirement plan. So, yeah, I think that's really surprising that people aren't contacting their super funds more often, and and mm-hmm. ties back into those other sort of you know stats that you mentioned, which is that Australians don't know about the taxation of superannuation. Um, and how it can they know whether they're in a low, low or high fee paying? You know, you yeah. know, in, in retirement you get what you don't pay for. So if you if you don't know if you're in something that's charging you more fees than the average, then yeah, that's the first sort of thing that you can control in that environment to sort of go okay, what Absolutely. are we paying in fees? Yeah. So more agency over super. It, it feels like something that the 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 profession and the industry really has to do some more work on. Um, but even the super funds really too, don't they? You know, there's yeah. there's a lot of ad, ads about super, but it it's not telling people how to make the best of their super. Yeah, true. And I think a lot of people just sort of just put it to one side for as long as they can, partly because it's complex yeah. and partly because they don't want to face face that potentially. But um, it's true. Yeah. Engagement is yeah, still a big issue. Yeah, it really is, and we've had superannuation now for for over thirty years. So, um, it's yeah. it's 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 got some work to do to to go that um, that next level and start to really be a trusted source of information um, and mm-hmm. something that that is easier to understand. Although I think superannuation is incredibly complex, um, so perhaps that's why the minute something starts to get complex is the minute that people potentially put the head in the sand mm. about that issue. Mm. Yeah. But given that, yeah. the biggest, you know, as you touched on earlier, the, the biggest thing that people are worried about is how my money will last and, and how can I improve my confidence there. Like an advice can go, can do so much to address that. And that, I guess the knock-on effects is not just confidence around your finances, but also a greater, like the, some of the behavioural research we've done in other parts of the world suggests that, yeah. you know, it's not just, confidence around finances, but also just emotional well-being, and that has knock-on effects to your overall health, well-being, Absolutely. relationships, family relationships. You would know this in your practice as well. Like it's yeah. it's 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 
it multi- it multiplies the benefits, I guess. Um, Correct. That's... Everything's intertwined, you know. And I think yeah. um, money is just one piece of the puzzle. It's not it's not the be all and end all. Otherwise, it would be the answer to a lot of people's problems. But it isn't. It's it it is. It brings confidence. Um, but yeah. confidence is educated by the fact that you know if if some people need a lot of money each year to live, and some people need very little. But probably everybody yeah. needs to know that whether it's very little or very a lot um, that you, you've got that resource there to meet those needs, which is what we've been talking about, that fear of running out. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's correct. I think that's something. And the other thing that you touched on at the beginning was talking about the fact that Australians aren't aware that they can make additional contributions. That astounded yeah. me. Yeah. 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 And yeah, savings is always a lever. And I think it was interesting that actually the younger generation seemed more willing to be making extra contributions over and above the SG contributions. Um, yes. I think, yeah, some of the younger generation were actually looking to probably probably with a view to maybe retiring earlier. Um, I think Ooh, maybe that's that true. maybe that's a motivation for some of the, the younger demographics who who can sort of think that maybe their retirement looks a little bit different than maybe their parents' generation. Um, but I thought that was interesting that the the those yeah. closer to retirement seemed less willing to be making those additional contributions relative to Gen X, the millennials and Gen Z. Sorry. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I agree. I thought that was very interesting. I do think we live in this information age. And so these younger generations probably yeah. have more information at their fingertips. Um, there's yeah. always people I think that don't want to be like mum and dad. So, you know, we've watched mum and dad work really, really hard and be a, a slave. And yes, I think there's a fire movement, you know, where people want to be financially independent, retire early. Uh, yeah. And so possibly they they are more engaged with the fact of putting money away for their future. I think they also understand, and certainly females would understand that there's a real impact if they're going to have time out of the workforce for either raising a family or caring for elderly parents, both of those scenarios can really dramatically affect their balance at retirement. So wonderful if they're already, um, you know, using that information to try and get ahead in their younger Mm. years for for that potential time off at some stage, whether it's retiring early or or caring for for somebody. Um, That's really great to see, but still very fascinating that those who are of that pre-retirement and retirement age aren't taking advantage of something that has tax benefits as well as retirement Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So that that tells me that, again, advisors have got a a real job of making sure that people are aware that they actually can put money in. Perhaps that's our fault. We think it's obvious that people know that there's the ability to contribute more to super. Um, Certainly, I know in my practice, we you know, those that have expressed an interest go on a list and we ring them all every sort of May and June um, Mm -hmm. just to remind them, you know, we send an email out and then we follow up with a phone call and they do forget. And we're busy. The world's complex. So, you know, it's it. And there's often competing priorities, mortgages and other things and people or holidays. (laughs) People (laughs) are sort of torn between, well, where should I put my, my money this year? But I think if we keep them accountable to their goals, um, that's a very valuable situation when they are actually retired. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good. Um, so I guess we've still we've still got some work to do, the profession as well as superannuation um, and, and making retirees feel more confident about their future. And you did also touch on the fact that it's a behavioural issue, which I think is something that a lot of people forget. Yeah. Um, as much as as much as it could be an investment um, issue, what fund are you in? What strategy have you got for making sure that money lasts and meets your income requirements? Um, which is also another sort of layer of complexity. And I think we're just about to enter that stage of, you know, a, a massive wave. I can't remember the numbers. I'm not sure if you know them, but um, of of the baby boomers that are going to start retiring now as well. Yeah. So we'll be really in a decumulation phase um, over the next sort of decade, decade or so. Yeah, I think we had a um, an event earlier in the year, and I think we're pretty much at the crest of that wave in terms of the peak number of people sort of entering entering that retirement phase. Yeah, so we'll be right. entering decumulation phase, which is clearly 
like a bit of a mindset shift from um, the last several years where most people have been focused on accumulation and accumulation solutions. And I guess the government yeah. and super funds are t- turning their attention to, I guess, income solutions or things that can help people um, have certainty in their retirement income. That That is increasingly become a focus. So it's increasingly yeah. a focus for us at Vanguard, and I imagine it is for you and your practice as well. For, yeah. Oh, most definitely. And, and I know that we're always sort of, you know, trying to keep up to date with those the research that's coming out as well as the products and, and things that are starting to be explored. Again, all of which, well, not all of them, but um, many of which are complex. And I think that yeah. that shows again that this this life stage, uh, we call it retirement, and whether you're working part-time or, or um, not at all, um, it's it's commonly known as retirement, but it, you know how that works for you is different for everybody. But I think there's still complexity with how we relate to um, those decisions that are going to help us make that money last our lifetime, and okay. again, when we looked at those retirement fears, I think that was that was the main one, wasn't it? That well leads us probably to that cost of living crisis that we're we're yeah. talking about on a regular basis nowadays. Yes, I think that was that was ever present. That was definitely on the top two concerns for both working age and also retirees. Although I think health issues pipped the post um, from retirees in terms of their number one concern, but it was certainly you know the top two concerns for both working age and retiree population was cost of living. Um, yeah. And I think that plays out as playing out slightly differently for each of those cohorts, obviously. Those who are earlier in their journey and, and have a mortgage have got cost of living plus additional costs of servicing the mortgage going on, whereas those um, who are in retirement and own their own homes are obviously benefiting from the higher interest rates that we're seeing coming through. So I think the cost of living concern was was front of mind for both cohorts, but um, I think it's sort of playing out slightly differently for, for different age groups. I'm not sure if you're seeing that in your practice too, but yeah. Oh, definitely. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think we, we're used to a system where the, the RBA and raising or lowering interest rates had a dramatic effect on the economy. Yeah. We, we do have a large cohort that are homeowners that – prefer their money in the bank and if they can get 5% interest, um, that meets a lot of their needs. Um, no, I don't no. think that, um, you know, so so when we're looking at how the economy is slowing down or the fact that some people are still, I know in my area I went out for one of my children's birthdays on a Monday night thinking that I wouldn't have to book anywhere and it'd be very easy to get in because people are concerned about the cost of living and, and the, the, the place was packed. But admittedly, mm. a lot of those people were either retired or, or very close to it. So potentially you're thinking, okay, they probably don't have a mortgage and they're not sort of sitting at home eating their baked beans. Um, they can afford to go out to dinner. So that's really going to play on the economic levers um, as well in the future, which I think we'll really start to to notice. But definitely I think you're right. I think we see um, retirees more co- comfortable when the, the interest rates are a bit higher. But not so not much. Not all retirees, right. but I think yeah, there's definitely a cohort in our research sample who were, who were I guess, less impacted by those. Those I mean, everyone's been impacted by cost of living increases, but some of those were more able to cope with it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good point. Certainly, from a couple of years back, when people were getting less than two percent, or even sometimes less than one percent in their bank account, that was a time where I think people were um, sort of concerned, especially if they if they had a low risk appetite. Um, but yeah, I think that those retirement fears is a, is a really interesting one. Um, certainly, it makes sense for the working age Australians to be really concerned about that high inflation, high living costs, because uh, I think we're feeling it right now. Um, and then the fact that more concerning for retired Australians is their health uh, and probably the financial impact of health, perhaps. Was that something that was raised? Yeah, I think so. I think it was more sort of, yeah, but didn't sort of unpack necessarily the, the things around that, but I think health considerations, yeah, do have a knock-on effect. I know in my from my own family's experience that definitely had a knock-on effect in terms of having to have one 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 party going to higher care for some for a period of time. That definitely has an impact financially and also emotionally. So that was um that was something that yeah. was I think it was very probably, challenging. Yeah. Primarily the I guess the impact is on Health and health concerns, and how that how that plays out in your day to day existence, um, but then yeah. financially as well, and how to manage that. 
Well, and that's definitely as we age, we know that our minds and bodies decline a little bit. So it's it's a, it's a common concern. I think most people um, expect to be concerned about their health as they age as well. Not that they've necessarily planned for it. So I think, again, planners can probably use this information as something to understand that if if that's a key concern about retirees, possibly starting to talk about how they might manage something like the transition to care, um, mm-hmm. what would that look like? Exploring that with those clients might again boost that confidence because if we've got these this higher percentage of more confident retired Australians, I think will, like you said, that flow and effect is is big on health um, yes. and attitude and happiness and, and all those uh, resilience, all those sorts of things that are really important in society that perhaps advisors have got a job to do there in terms of helping clients understand maybe how they can manage the financial impact of health. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just knowing that you've got that backup plan or insurance policy in essence, you know, probably counterintuitively means that maybe you won't have to use it, hopefully. So, yeah, it's true, actually, yeah, isn't it? If, Sometimes if you, law. <laughs> yeah, actually, if you know you've got the plan B in place and you, it actually might mean that you stay healthier because you're less worried about those things. So, yeah, definitely. Exactly. It's all connected. It's all connected. It is all connected. And I think that's where, you know, understanding that it's all intertwined. And that's what this research was so helpful in understanding this. It, it, it all crosses over. We've sort of woven around with those key areas today. But I think um, that's exactly why, because everything sort of ties into one another as well. Um, so I guess we, we, we sort of touched on those fears along the way, but it's more there's, there's, a, there's a massive role advisors can play in helping retirees. Uh, I think we've got some real barriers to to getting advice out there, um, helping people find an advisor. Maybe even probably didn't come out in this research, but I sort of sense that there's probably some people that had a bad experience prior to the Royal Commission. So, you know, yeah. trust is something that still needs to be built and earned. Um, and, you know, the media does a wonderful job of showing all the things that have gone wrong, not necessarily all the things that advisors do right. So I think this research is really important at highlighting the connection between planning and advice and the confidence of retirees and, and those who are feeling that they know how much money they've got. I think superannuation funds will probably start to be better equipped and potentially some of the quality of advice review work that's starting to be implemented may help um, lift that knowledge of everyday Australians because they, they may start to reach out to their super fund more for that at, at least basic level of understanding of what I can yeah. put in, how do I use my super, what are the fees I'm paying, what are the options I've got and the choices inside my fund. Um, yeah. and, and then potentially if they've got more complexity in their life in terms of maybe how to get confident that their needs are going to be met how to make sure that they can provide to their their children if they wish to either while they're alive or or as a legacy. Um, They're the sort of things that potentially they're going to need to seek advice on. Um, They're more complex and there's there's a fair bit of work to do. But I think just remembering or for advisors out there who are listening to remember that these fears uh, that have been expressed are a, a real representation of everyday Australians. And even if they are your advised clients, remembering that they'd really probably love to see the modelling that shows that their money's going to last their lifetime, the conversation around what to do if something changes with your health, um, showing them and having that confidence conversation, I think, is a really important piece. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was encouraging as well that, you know, one in five Australians said, well, they might have said they need a financial advisor right now. Twenty About a quarter said they would consider using an advisor um, either in an ongoing relationship or, or or just as one-off advice, which is, I guess, a good starting point. Um, and that yeah. probably outweighed the, the lack of trust as an inhibitor, which is sort of 20%. So actually people are more, I guess, open to, to seeking that advice than that inhibitor of, either not knowing an advisor or that lack of trust issue. So I think that's waning. So that's, so I think that's Yeah, I, I would agree. Advisors. I think most, yeah. yeah, definitely. I think most advisors I know are, are you know, run off their feet. Um, exactly. And I think, you know, people nowadays reach out to their community and even, even social media community groups of, you know, who, who's someone local I can go to or, and, you know, you'll get a whole range of people um, being listed there. And, and you know, like every um 
profession, you've got to find that right fit, you know, so people hopefully get that choice of a number of people that they can go and do the research on and go and sort of find out who's right for them, whether it is transactional ongoing. I don't really Mm. feel that everybody needs ongoing advice. There's some people that have just a standard one-off need um, and that can be met. Yes, there may be other opportunities when things change in their life to go back and seek additional advice. And there are plenty of clients with complexity where it's the advisor skill that might sort of you know, pull out that data about the fact that, you know, this ongoing relationship might really be of value to you because of Absolutely. these sorts of things. Not always, you know, c- complexity in terms of the wealth, but I think the behaviours, I think that's where a lot of advisors um, can be really great at understanding those clients that are at risk of making poor decisions or very vulnerable because they don't have the confidence. That's where yep. the value of advice can really sort of play a big part. Absolutely. Yeah. We're big advocates for advice. Thank God. Excellent. And I think that's, that's yeah, it's, it's a really great research paper. I definitely encourage all advisors listening to please um, jump onto Vanguard's website and uh, download the report, How Australians Retire, and have a look at 2023 too because that was really interesting to see that yeah. some of that data has changed. I think you can really see the evidence of that being affected by this cost of living crisis. Um, yeah. I imagine we'll still see continual changes each year. I hope you keep doing this um, this research. Yes, we're already in the early, early planning stages for next year's um, retirement, how Australia retires survey. So, yeah, so Great. June 12th. This will be an annual thing, I think. Yeah. Excellent. No, it's really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing um, that information with us today, Libby. Thanks. <laughs> 